Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Tech for Leaders podcast brought to you by Mazars. This is the podcast where we take technology topics and discuss how business leaders can tackle them. I'm your host, Andrew Rawlings Catterall, a privacy specialist in technology and digital, and we'll be talking throughout this series with industry guests, specialist speakers, and subject matter experts about how businesses are tackling the latest tech developments and challenges whilst minimizing risk and ensuring security and regulatory compliance. At Mazars, we believe technology can help businesses, both large and small, help improve and advance their operations, improve productivity and growth. And so we look forward to sharing our knowledge, our insights, practical tips, and how businesses can leverage technology to gain that all important edge. And now, on with this week's show. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Tech for Leaders podcast with Mazar. For our returning listeners, welcome back, and to our new listeners, thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Alex Miller. I'm an ethical hacker and red teamer, which means that I break computers and computer networks for a living to help customers understand their cyber risk. In today's episode, we're going to be exploring how we can counter cyber threats using military strategies. How does traditional warfare vary to cyber warfare? And what can industry learn from this? To discuss this topic, I'm thrilled to be joined by Chris Parker, MBE, Director of Government Strategy at Fortinet. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Chris is an experienced military officer and has 15 years business experience spanning the oil and gas sector, major construction projects, and cybersecurity. Welcome, Chris. Really excited to have you here today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to join us. Thank you. And I'm sure our listeners are familiar with Fortinet, but just as a reminder, they're a multinational cybersecurity vendor and have just been um, named as leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant even for the third year in a row. So Mm -hmm. congratulations on that. Thank you. Thanks. Perfect. So we'll get cracking then. Chris, I wonder if we start with your military career. How did that lead you to cybersecurity? Was that an obvious transition? Well, for me, there was a bit of a gap. But when you look at the two um, industries, effectively, it's about when you're in the military, whatever level in the military or whatever job you do, it's about managing risk. I mean, that's even if you're not on operations, you're in training or you're you're in uh, some other role, you're effectively part of the risk management process. So when you think about that and you drop those skill sets into the cyber world, it's actually quite a neat fit. And there's a big push at the moment, including with Fortinet, to try and convince uh, quite a lot of veterans to think about cybersecurity as a career because, of course, there's a skills gap. Mm. I've I've certainly worked with people on the Tech for Vets scheme, and there's been some amazing talent come through that. Mm. It's a great scheme. And I think the thing is, it's confidence. A lot of it is confidence where people feel, no, that can't surely be me. But actually, it is because not everyone in cyber has to be a a coder. I mean, it's only probably about 20% people have to be in that coding level. Mm. Other people are in various roles. It could be sales, it could be design, it could be customer relations. There's lots of things where you have to have an understanding, again, of the risk management process. So it's a really good fit. And I, I suppose the military themselves have been tackling wide-ranging, ever-changing threats for a lot longer than the cybersecurity sector has. I mean, you mentioned to me that your regiment is over 400 years old. Wow. Mm, absolutely. So how, what, what principles do the military use when tackling and analyzing yeah. these threats? I think it's, um, we all know that security sort of has three parts. doesn't matter what, what role you're in in security. It could be in physical security or in cybersecurity. Effectively, it's about some equipment or technology. Then there's the processes which are really important and the people which of course are vital and re- really important to things so in terms of the way that the military evolves and you think of 400 years for example the evolution of that knowledge process building up so you can imagine that the people might change and the equipment might evolve but the processes are absolutely fantastic and the processes evolve too but they're based on really sound and proven principles uh, making sure you mitigate risk so that's why particularly the processes in use in the military are really worth looking at for cybersecurity. And I wonder how the attribution of threats plays into that. Am I right in thinking that military threats, particularly of nations, they're they're pretty well understood and documented whereas in cyber these capabilities are are much less un, are much more unknown I should say. Is yeah. is that just cuz they're newer or, or 
Or where do you think that's heading? I think it's part of evolution, isn't it? When you have the the threat evolving, and we've seen that in, you take conventional warfare, the evolution of threat, you know, the the dawn of the tank, which took over from the horse, and all those sort of famous big revolutions in military affairs, as they're known. But I think for um, the problem with knowing where that threat's coming from, that that just means, and again, in a military mindset, the huge need for intelligence, so proper refined information to make intelligence. And threat intelligence is enormous fundamental in cybersecurity to make sure we're aware of not only where the threats might come from, but what sort of threats they are, and actually being really clever, thinking about what might be coming next, because no one wants to get caught out. You've always got to overmatch the target. And that's very much the same in in the military philosophy, uh, but that can have problems as well because you, you can't just th- keep throwing resources at it in a limited resources world. You know, if you're in the financial sector, you might have a bit more budget than perhaps a, a public sector local council. But the reality is, you've got to keep overmatching a threat, and you've got to know where you where you put your assets and your resources. It's a choice. So, and you, you go, you can take it to something like military protection, maybe take a tank. So there's always this huge issue with uh, tank armor that, yes, you could make it more and more thick, but that makes the tank heavier and more cumbersome. So you have to have a bigger engine. And if you ever have a bigger engine, that makes it even more cumbersome and thirsty and everything else. But also you perhaps want to have um, a bigger gun on it because the tank's got to have a gun on it as well. So you have this cycle and the problem is the thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Whereas actually the reality is moving around quite fast is actually quite a good way of staying alive on a battlefield. And agility in cybersecurity, so simplicity, the ability to respond, is the same thing. So it's actually this back to this combination of having equipment, but also good processes and good people, and keep blending that and refining it to make sure you get the right mix. Mm. But it is that is that response to the threat you've got to know, which is why certainly Fortinet and other companies in the industry are really strong on threat intelligence, because that's the most important part of finding out what you need to do. Yeah, and I guess we are kind of classifying and monitoring threat intelligence in a more strategic way in the industry through APT groups, which for our listeners, um, that stands for Advanced Persistent Threats. And it's a kind of mechanism for classifying threat actors based on their behavior and their capabilities. So is that a step in the right direction towards kind of the traditional military strategy? Yeah, it is. I think it is. And it really, I mean, that sort of mentions what we perhaps term something like strategic threats. So some things which are very high impact. Uh, And APTs, advanced persistent threats, I mean, I always say to people, it does what it says on the tin. So they're advanced. It's very high, technically capable threat. Mm. But also they're persistent. It's something that is really hard to get get rid of or avoid. They're coming at you and they're coming at you in ways that perhaps haven't been done before. Um, so it's really the hardest part of threat to, to, to uh, fight against in the cyber world. But what does that mean? Again, in a military principle, you always match the worst opportunity. You always think about the worst scenario. And if you're ready for that, then if you roll back from that, then everything should be fine. But there is, of course, an example where if you are a small local business based in a small town in, in the UK, you don't really want to be resourcing against advanced persistent threats because it would be nice, but you won't be able to necessarily afford it. Mm. So there's a balance of risk and perhaps those smaller users and perhaps even smaller public sector areas are becoming, again, a bit like the agile tanks, the ones that are lighter moving around on the battlefield faster. So perhaps they just can't be seen as much as a big organization such as an oil company or a financial institution or a government department, something big big to attack. So there's um, that advanced persistent threat thing won't go away, but that's something, again, the threat intelligence, we're constantly watching that and monitoring it. In Fortinet, we do it all the time to make sure we're aware globally of any new threats that emerge. And of course, the important part about having any intelligence is sharing it. Mm. I mean, it really is in the military, it's nothing worse than someone, you finding out someone's been hit or had a casualty even when someone knew about something that was going to happen and just didn't share it. So we have automated threat intelligence being shared through all our systems in Fortinet and those systems allow users to see. And if I had that in the military, in the days when I was in the military, that would have been incredible to be able to see everything on one screen and know that everything's automatically being secured. That's that's heaven. So uh, there's some great technology going on now, which allows us to always stay ahead of that threat, which is really important. And how should business leaders be narrowing down that threat intelligence? I think sometimes the threat landscape can seem overwhelming. It's so large, as you said, if you're a small Mm, organization, APT groups are probably not something, as you said, you want to be concerned about. The threat's too overwhelming and too... Um, it, it, it's not reasonable. How yeah, how how should businesses true. narrow that? It comes it becomes um, 
one word really automation i mean you you cannot cope with it the amount of stuff coming out some of the the customers uh, today out in the market may be getting thousands of attacks a day or a week i mean it's an enormous level to cope with and so automation has to go there mm. but in the military analogy that's what happens in the military world as well because if you take um, warfare at sea so you now have had um, where you got missiles coming in or you might have a, a bomber coming in to try and take out your warship then actually automated systems have been going for quite some time you we people have seen the videos on YouTube of these amazing guns that come out and shoot down the uh, the missiles coming in. But again, they're, they're refined very well. It's high-tech stuff because mm. you don't really want to be harming a seagull that happens to be flying past because that's not particularly fair or environmentally friendly. And it's also a waste of resources. So things have to be tuned appropriately. So automation is has to be there, and that's based on good integrated systems but also the rise of AI. Artificial intelligence has allowed the tuning of that system to constantly be there, a learning process, so that the correct response can be matched to the correct threat always and very swiftly, day and night. So that's a that I think is the most beautiful advance in cybersecurity because it doesn't rely on the weakest part which is us, the human, because mm -hmm. I mean, I have to sleep, I have to go and have a party sometime. And sometimes I may be feeling a bit ill or at work and I can't really do perform to 100% level, but an automated system pretty much is always there day and night. And that's what's the, the best security people can get. And as part of these improvements to the kind of technology of the three pillars, we talked about people, technology um, and process. Do you feel like improvements to technology, there'll always be that people backstop, right? Even though maybe people are, quote unquote, the weakest section. Mm. Um, actually, in some ways, we're also the strongest because as these AI and technology advance, um, there, there's always, or I don't know, maybe there won't be, but at the moment, certainly, there's questions that AI can't answer mm -hmm. and we need people to kind of yeah, come no, and add the right. common sense. Absolutely right. And I think... Again, remembering my point on humans being in its potentially the weakest part because we do have off days mm. um, and as much is that part, but we are very strong, absolutely, in the, the decision-making process, the ability to focus. And the key thing that systems and automated processes can help us is having that, what we call in Fortinet, a single pane of glass is something that a human can look at one screen, one pane of glass and make a decision. And in the same in the military analogy, to allow a commander, which is exactly what a, is happening in a response in a cyber incident, someone to make a decision on the uh, organization based on really accurate, focused, good intelligence of what is going on here. Is this an attack or is this a, a perhaps a deception attack? Is something else going on? Mm -hmm. And the, the ability to actually make a decision. Yes, you're absolutely right, Alex. The mm -hmm. human is still in my view, the best person when it comes to complexity, because our brains are actually the most amazing processes. We can really Agreed. do it. And yep. and in the military, don't forget that's still the way as well. I mean, people talk about automated aircraft, drones and things, but actually the ability to know where where to prosecute an attack or to report something, the what they call the Mark One eyeball and the human brain is still a really incredible system. So it's not without that blend. It, I mean, we don't drop the human out of the process. Yeah. I think what we actually do is we enhance it. We make mm. the human the human more useful, more focused, yeah. and make an easier decision. And that's the best part. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And that's certainly how where I see the improvements in technology going, as you say. Yeah proving greater assistance to people to make better informed decisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder also if there are some scenarios where it's cyber warfare and traditional warfare, they, they actually meet. Um, what's really the difference if we see a kinetic or a violent effect in something compared to a soft effect, a cyber effect? Perhaps, you know, if I'm, yes, a kinetic effect versus me on my laptop turning something off that creates negative output for a company. What's the difference there? Yeah, there's some there's, in warfare. It's much the same, I suppose, because there's this sort of soft effect, and then there's a hard or kinetic effect. And really, um, we think about it in cyber. It's also the same because we think about it. It could be a, a soft effect in a cyber attack. Could be someone stealing some data and then retaining it for the time then they want to release it or embarrass a, an organization, for example. Mm. But a hard attack may be something where they want to actually uh, really genuinely disrupt. So actually, an OT attack for operational technology to perhaps disrupt a, a public utility system or something like that. We've seen these sort of attacks before, haven't we? So I think I think there's there's always a difference in the level of attack there. I don't think there's um, any easy comparisons to draw between the types of attack in military and the types of attack in cyber. I would talk more about the effect 
mm-hmm. on the operator or the user. So the effect is, is it something that we don't know anything about because some data has been taken and we just don't know until suddenly some emails are released on the web and it's very embarrassing for everybody? Or is it something where we suddenly find, why are all the lights off? Why is everything going <laughs> wrong here? What's going on? You yes. know? And, and so the effect on the user is the key part. And that's where, again, automation and AI do amazing things now. There's some new technology, latest technologies, which just as in the military world, where there's an evolution of technology going on, in the cyber world, it's incredible, some of the new systems. We have systems that are the electronic equivalent of sitting on the network and just watching and waiting and almost literally just looking about on the network and seeing for abnormal behavior and things that shouldn't be going on. Yeah. And if you think about it, and if that was a, a building or a human response, that would be the equivalent of, of guards walking around with torches at night and saying, what's going on here? Why is this window open? What's going on? So there's those sort of systems. And then we also have systems which even deceive. So if something does penetrate and gets through to deception level, you can actually have replication of the network and things where systems are... Um, available for people to think that they've actually found something honey interesting. Pots. Absolutely, the honeypots, mm-hmm. the famous sort of term, but then also to to be shut down and literally locked in there or observed. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, these are great new advances in technology which are really helping cope against this overwhelming threat. And actually, we have to remember that cybersecurity is still ultimately a big game of psychology. There's someone at the other end trying to prosecute these attacks. So therefore, if they start to see that certain organizations are using really high tech, it's going to make them have to really do a tough job to get in, a really hard job. Whereas perhaps maybe a few years ago, it was a lot easier for the attacker. Mm, Certainly. I think the amount of data being able to be ingested by blue teams, by defensive SOCs, security operation centers is really increasing. Um, Mm. But it is interesting that there's some kinetic effects as a result of cyber and Absolutely. industry will be feeling that, as you said, mm. in operational technology, even in just offices, if I can turn the AC off and it mm. suddenly gets a bit warm. Mm. Or even worse than that, I can turn off the cooling system in a server room through a cyber attack and potentially cause a fire or something like that. It's interesting that we're now seeing potential kinetic effects as a result of perhaps soft kind of attacks on cyber. Absolutely. And I think, again, remembering that the human can be at risk there that we perhaps get into habits and we perhaps don't see things that are repeated as easily or abnormal behavior as easily as a machine might do um, we often do see things that are abnormal in our homes and we say that's that's not right i didn't leave that there or you don't know why something is moved or a window is open so that's our natural human instincts but automated automation wise that can be seen straight away so it's mm-hmm. another great use of ai whereas uh, i can ex- tell you for example in fortinet some of the ai introduction into some of our products has increased capability by perhaps 25% straight away. So it allows, again, the tightening of that security nut to make sure that the ability to spot abnormal behavior and something that's just not right through some form of process of artificial intelligence on that system, learning on that organization that this is not right. That Mm. person should not be accessing those folders uh, because they shouldn't be doing it on a weekend. And those sort of things are just abnormal. Now, there may be normal things that are happening there, but the ability to flag it up yeah. That's the most important part of that early phase of resisting a potential cyber attack. And if it's someone just working at the weekend and just wants to go and find a CV or something, um, then that can perhaps be explained and that can be at least be known. That's the key part. It can be found early. Yeah, and I guess this is an interesting part where our two jobs are quite different because my job as a red teamer is to test the effectiveness of these kind of products and mm. controls. And uh, I guess that's an interesting parallel between the military we talked before about thinking enemy Mm. and i guess that's essentially what my job and the foundation of penetration testers and red teaming's Mm. whole philosophy is is that a really one of the best examples of cybersecurity using military strategies yes i think it is and i think when you look at it the, the the vitality of having that practice the rehearsal is a fundamental in military operations so before any operation any patrol any level i was in there was always a rehearsal or a discussion or people would use a model and they'd work out and say what can go wrong here what can go wrong there and the ability to red team is is a human factor integration as well the penetration part being um very good for technology uh, assessment Mm -hmm. but the combination of those those systems using them together are vital. I really do believe. I always say to people that, you know, unless you're introducing that level of rehearsal, level of that mental process, then you then you get a bad day and it's going to be a very bad day because if you think about it, there's um there's a beautiful expression in the in the military flying world when they're training and they say there's no new air accidents 
only new pilots. And what that means is that if people apply themselves professionally, and we are all professionals in this industry, but we've got to behave like it, we've got to study. And that can be tough. We've got to find time to study and look at incidents and things that got on. So instantaneously, that pilot who studied an accident report where he saw a, a sudden increase in engine temperature, he'll know immediately what's going on and he'll know what probably has caused it because he's read about it. He yeah. studied his profession. And we ought to do that in our profession because a red team or a pen tester or indeed just studying attacks that have happened elsewhere in the world can allow people to say, I think I, I know what's going on here. And the, there's a great story, which I think uh, many people know, the listeners out there will be saying, um, to the, the podcast would have been aware of uh, the Sony, a great incident in 2014, a very, very bad hack that was going on. Um, very famous, so we won't dwell on that. But the, one of the big things that came out of it afterwards is that a very young person in employee had spotted the vulnerability and flagged it up. But the senior people in the IT department were actually very negative about it, this being raised, but also... Um, had a real go at the individual, almost to the point of bullying, mm. and that poor individual left the organization, and then they got hit. Yeah. So even that shows us a great lesson, because that's, that's all about teaching these lessons, which is very military. Yeah. How can we learn from these things? And therefore, we should say, well, let's not be like that. those people in that department who are poor. It wasn't Sony who was poor. It was the individuals being negative, which had an impact on the organization. And what happened was very bad. So let's not do that. Let's make sure we listen to our young people, especially because they see things very differently to those of us who've been doing things a bit longer and we, we get confident, sometimes a bit relaxed and as humans, and therefore someone young, someone fresh saying, this doesn't look right, or I think someone could get in on this. That's a beautiful thing we should encourage in our organization. So even there's an example, we've just done one, of where you just do a learning process and, in, and improve things in the processes in the organization. Yeah, I guess the military is very good at continuous improvement. Yeah. And I certainly see when I'm talking to businesses, so many are focused on the end goal of security yes. as opposed to actually the process of continuous improvement. Mm. Security is you know, intangible, right? And it's not really mm. a, a useful yeah. frame of reference. And when we look at ISO 27001, the international standard of cybersecurity, really the heart of that is continuous improvement. It is. So that's mm. another military strategy that we're starting to see seep in, is it? No, it is, absolutely. I think the, the big thing that's come out of those processes, which is, is the formalization mm. of what certainly anyone who's military would see those, or ex-military would see those processes and see them as quite normal, uh, because there's constant improvement. So again, before any um, operation goes ahead, there's lots of training, lots of looking at what's going on currently currently in the operation, um, what could go wrong, the risks are assessed. Um, we would have a risk matrix in our organizations today. How much do they get used? There's the question. I always say to people, can I see your risk matrix? And they sort of mm -hmm. I normally work out how long they take to find it because there should be a link <laughs> on their desktop. But that's a great tool. It's not something just to state something and say, that's it. Again, you know, it's actually a tool. So a risk matrix, just as the military have, you constantly evolve and look at it and you examine. Mm. And a sector that's really good at this is the oil and gas sector. Mm. For safety reasons, they are really hot on risk matrix and you have to discuss before meetings, any risks are in the room and they want to keep their statistics low because safety, of course, is vitally important in what is a very dangerous sector with volatile liquids and people at risk. So they're really hot on that. So that's sort of almost a health and safety type approach in a, in a different sector it certainly taught me a lot that by using those processes rehearsing and again it's back to red teaming can we can we learn from getting external people to come in rather than just us being confident that our own systems are okay um it's a it's a complex um blend of things needed but whatever happens it's that helix it's that progression forward it's not a cycle yeah. it's a constant moving third dimension helix going forward and that's what the military always aspire to. And I think in the cybersecurity industry, um, we do that as a vendor. We're always improving our equipment, our quality controlling, our checking. I mean, that's why a lot of people are surprised when people say there's a vulnerability. Actually, a lot of the times, most times, the vulnerability is actually something that's been found by good quality assurance, and someone's just tightening that helix. Yeah. They're making things better. So I always think this is that we should celebrate it because uh, vulnerability is a sign of something getting better rather than everyone being negative about things. And if we're never going to improve things, then there's going to be more gaps because the, the threat, the adversary, is always improving. They're always trying to get at us. It mm, goes back to what you were saying about the Sony hack. And mm. actually, if we listened to people within our teams and accepted diversity of thought, that actually we would all be more secure. Mm, absolutely. I yeah. think... Um, it's interesting the people part of the people technology process um, kind of 
triad. We see in the military, you've got very strong roles and responsibilities, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody knows the chain of command and their roles and responsibilities. I see that a lot less in cyber. Things are Mm. a lot grayer. Do you think that's an issue? It's a great point. I think it's something that it actually concerns me sometimes in some organizations because, again, back to the human factors, people have to go away. They sometimes get called away. They might fall sick or a loved one might be ill. So people have to know instantly who is what we would call in the in the military the second in command and perhaps then the third in command. Now, this is in the military formally stated before any operation, even a patrol going out somewhere in a, in a uh, foreign country, somewhere would always be saying before the patrol, and that's largely actually redundancy being built into the system, it's what we would call, mm-hmm. uh, but it's being built into the command and control. Yeah. So, for example, if something happens to me on the patrol and I have to go off somewhere or I have to take a casualty off somewhere, then it might be you, Alex, you have to take over and then everyone would know instantly something happens who's in charge there's not going to be some debate in it well who's making the call here who's deciding and that's not a good place to be so there's a fundamental organizational responsibility um and that you can use things like the racy matrix and other responsible responsibility tools which are there in business Mm -hmm. but actually it just needs to be stated um and i think also more and more we're seeing where there's too much uh in the cyber industry too much being loaded onto one person that's normally the CISO. of course there are other terms for it but if we think about that load that's being increased then he or she cannot cope with those loads uh i think this office of the CISO, which I, i tend to call it will end up being the CISO. But yeah. In large organizations, I, I think there will now be a career chain. I would encourage it for having um, a deputy CISO, perhaps times two. And then you might have assistant CISOs below those. So there's always redundancy there. And this is a career path. This is a career chain. And these people, of course, as we spoke before, are not necessarily going to be coder level capability, but they're just into managing cyber and the procurement of equipment and other such important things. Yeah. And just for our listeners, CISO Chief Information Security Officer, right? Yes. So yeah. um, I wonder if there's something to be learned about the the roles and responsibility from the kind of checking the checker standpoint. We talked about yeah, this before. I did. What is checking the checker? Checking the checker. This is, well, this is one <laughs> thing. If there's one thing from the podcast that people take away is checking the checkers because it's such a brilliant uh, military principle. Um, and it's an evolution of over the hundreds of years of military, especially in the, in the British and American and other great military uh, systems where they fundamentally have got better. So checking the checker is about saying the system, the organization is never going to be content that everything's being done, we're just going to check. And we're not only going to check, we're going to ask someone to check on that person doing the check, because that means there's no risk, no problem. Now, people might find that a little bit awkward. Mm. Uh, In the military, there's absolutely no one sees it as difficult or offensive. If someone goes into check, I used to have to do it as a young officer, used to do these weekly checks on perhaps the ammunition or the uh, oil and gas dipping the tanks to make sure the right amount of liquid was still there. Now, that wasn't seen as offensive. What was actually happening there is it means that the person who's doing the checking actually knows that he or she will be checked on. Yeah. Now, that therefore means is that the effect on the organization is if that person's having a bad day or is tired or has been unable to do their checks. I mean, how many times have we seen, I haven't been able to do the patching, says someone in an IT department, because I've just been too busy. Well, okay. But then if they know there's going to be a check, perhaps a weekly or monthly check by someone senior saying, let's just check the patch register and where are we up to. Um, and if that's the case, then those people know they have to put their hand up which is a beautiful thing in an organization because that improves safety for all the data and the people and the organization because they're saying, I'm really struggling here with the workload. I just can't do these patches and I can't do this or that. So they know that they're not going to get caught out because they've put their hand up, but the organization becomes safer because that's an example where someone would just say, okay, we'll get in some uh, extra help this week. We'll buy some professional services or what it may be to come in and assist us uh, for a day and get us up to speed. That's just made the organization safer. Mm. So it's back to how those processes, which sometimes seem a bit odd and perhaps can seem a bit tight, and people think that's almost offensive, saying that I'm not doing my job properly. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Because if, if the culture is there that people say, hi, you're here to do the check, that's great. That, that's the way it should be. So we need to get over our egos a little bit here. I think when it comes to safety and security, um, egos have to take a, a back seat. <laughs> exactly. And I think that process, back to that process part, if the process is really good, and everyone knows why it's there. Yeah. That's the big thing. Don't bring in a process anywhere and just impose it. 
explain why it's there and say that system. But look, you know, you might be having a bad day sometime or you might be overloaded. You know, I'm going to come around and check. So this just means put your hand up because I don't want to be checking. And then, then you tell me I've not done the checks for some time. And yeah. don't forget that happened in the military as well. When I mean, you sometimes do these checks and it would all come out that someone's just lost something and just struggling with their job. They were perhaps not competent or capable or just weren't were having some problems in their domestic life. These are human factors. So at least we find out about it. That's what checking the checkers is all about. Yeah, and I see that in red teaming, that it's an interesting dynamic if I'm checking how good somebody is at defending when that's their you know day job. It's important that that's not taken personally. We're actually working with them, mm. even though in a direct sense we're working against somebody. Um, yeah. It's yeah. interesting how many things that, that can crop up from the people technology process stack. Um, if technology is maybe not configured properly but is excellent mm. or maybe you know an alert hasn't shown when it should do or whatnot, um, just making sure that those are spotted before an actual breach happens, Absolutely. as you're saying. And that happens also when our people like Fortinet as vendors, when we would go and we wouldn't just sell something and then walk off. We would actually go and visit and check and make sure everything's okay. And almost like a, a sort of a, an update, you'd pop it, pop down or, or get in touch. And often we find people haven't, um, because electronically we can tell, haven't activated perhaps licenses they've bought. Mm. So they bought something <laughs> and they just haven't got around to getting it up. Yeah. Now, and, and some people watching it might be intrigued to hear that, but Again, human factors. People are very busy and understaffed and they've got issues. And perhaps they forgot. You know, I can perhaps resonate they forgot. with that. Yeah. You know, it does the, happen, right? The yeah. amount of red teams I've been on where mm. the technology is awesome but hasn't been configured properly. Absolutely. And therefore, like you were saying about the pane of glass, the lens that operators, that people in blue teams and protective defensive teams are seeing mm. isn't giving them good data. Mm. So they've got great technology, they've got great people, but they're not working well together. The process Absolutely. hasn't been configured and therefore... Yeah, I, well, that's so. well. That's why Fortinet has staff because it's not just the people <laughs> doing the design and wonderful tech stuff, which we have out in California and a few other places. But amazing. But for me, the beautiful thing is that we've got the staff to be able to help and check. So again, if people find that they they think that might be the case, they should just ring up and say, "I don't understand it," and we can easily help and interrogate it. But I still think, it, but that's back to process and anything that helps that helix, that tightening of the security nut all the time. Yeah. Because coming at, at us the other way is another helix of the bad people who are trying to do disrupt our systems and our life, and they will be improving their systems all the time. So we have to keep our helix going as well. Mm. And what about that process point when you hit the unfortunate scenario of having a breach? How does the military deal with incidents and, and what can we learn from that? Yeah, incident response. Um, the biggest part about any military incident I've been involved in, I've been involved in a lot, is that most cases, I can't think of many, where they didn't actually do anything different to what I've found in my training. So good training, good rehearsal. So it's back to red teaming, mm -hmm. working out the scenario. And again, empower the young if there's someone in the department who's young who's got a fresh mind ask them to have a look at what can go wrong and write some scenarios and those things can really help then perhaps once a month once a quarter any organization have, a, have an afternoon it's often great to do it on a friday afternoon get it all done together and work out what what gaps there are appearing so that instant response is based fundamentally in the military on preparation mm -hmm. and drills so that's back to processes so instantly doing things so but there's two levels i would think there's normally those drills which are response so often that can be automated in our systems enforcement we have a lot of fantastic stuff that can help um, some of our systems do fifty thousand alerts where on a day whereas a, a normal analyst can perhaps cope with 30 or 40 on a, if they're really going at it so the automated systems can really allow when you're having that volume of threat coming in, which some organizations sadly see, to overmatch that and beat that away with the response skills. But then that's the the immediate level. But then there's that higher level of response, which is more, more executive, more thinking about the organization. And I um, used to run an organization, a company myself, where we used to help advise organizations post-breach and what they would look like post-breach. Right. What was interesting is the biggest thing that would impact on the organization would not necessarily be just the technology, 
it would be the way that they communicated this out to their people, their shareholders, their stakeholders, yeah. and also internally. Um, back to that Sony uh, incident, which is a great one to study. They didn't really get their information out internally through HR or have a redundancy system. They went dark. Therefore, they people were tweeting and speaking and ringing their friend who works for the media and all that stuff. Yeah. So you've got to control some form of output of the information. So there's the, the biggest parts about doing these red teaming and learning is that those fringe things those things that seem unimportant yeah often become the most important communications yeah. media pr post instant post breach um and of course the big thing is to make sure that people are reassured it could be people public servants it could be the public yeah. they need to be reassured and customers that everything's okay we've invested in good systems we're dealing with a what is ultimately normally a criminal activity and the illegal activity so to put out some sensible lines there can normally help yeah. yeah, it's amazing how much, as you said, preparation and something not it being is. novel can help you kind of have more gusto in that moment to Absolutely. deal with things. And people will never know, Alex, I mean, if, unless they rehearse it. And they've yeah. got to rehearse it. And I find the, the light, I, I joy at seeing the light bulbs come on when people say, this has been an amazing three hours because I've got this whole <laughs> list on a whiteboard of things that we need to do. And we're going to, again, tighten the nut, get the helix going again, and add to the great technology to make the whole system of security get better. It's just that little bit less scary. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that, that's a very good point. I mean, it actually adds to that reassurance and competence and confidence mm. in staff, especially in the IT department, that they're able to deal with this. They can they can cope with it. And what we find is often people forget new joiners in the organization. So we may get a, um, a young man or woman join the organization and they feel to themselves, okay, this is great. But then they happen to be on duty on that day, but they weren't involved in the rehearsal that happened six months ago. Yeah. So often people forget that when you bring someone new into the organization, good process, that they should always be run, they should always run a team rehearsal again to make sure they're all brought into it. So there's some great sort of little tweaks there, a process that can just make sure um, that I think it's Murphy's second law, isn't it? That things will go wrong, but it'll go wrong at the worst time. Yeah. And it's always going to be when the, perhaps the most junior person is um, on duty and perhaps the most senior person is away at a family wedding and the phone is off. So this is always the, the thing. So rehearsals and preparation, again, sound military principles, perfect for cybersecurity and can tighten that uh, helix and tighten that security nut. Mm, and as you were saying with intelligence earlier on, that actually goes back the other way, right? Because we have attackers mm. using open source intelligence, things they can glean from the internet. Maybe the person at the wedding's posted about it. We know that they're not on shift. Maybe the new joiners shared lovely information about their new role. Uh, would be something that an attacker would probably target, right? Absolutely. And I'm afraid that uh, people are now waking up to the fact that, sadly, in our society, people will look at those things, those feeds. That doesn't mean people can't have any fun. Mm. I think people have just got to be a bit circumspect about what they are posting and saying sometimes, a bit of awareness. I know that uh, there's great organizations out there that can help any organization uh, by looking at what's being posted by them and done. But then also on the on that sort of deeper level, that sort of dark web level, um, there's some wonderful new technology which is uh, ongoing in the industry at the moment. We've got a new product out at the moment which is causing some great excitement, which is called 40 Recon. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it does what it says on the tin. It's actually a reconnaissance back onto your own organization from our expert researchers who will look and actually look inside on the dark web as well as to what's being seen about your organization, what's being offered, yeah. but also perhaps more importantly, what you look like. And that is a fundamental military principle. Whenever you were doing any defensive position, you would always be taught from day one, you go out to where the enemy would come from and you have a look at their approach in. And it's much easier then to see the issue. So to see an organization, to see if there's any two or three IT staff, can we perhaps work out who they are, get on their Facebook, those sort of things. So then we just have to warn our staff. Yep. So all these things are good processes, good principles. Um, but again, new technology, latest systems out there that can really help enhance. And they have done already. They've started to really secure organizations by spotting these things in the attack phase very early. That's mm. the beauty of it. They spot and defeat it before it even happens. Mm. Amazing. I wonder if we just step back from things a little bit now. The, the cyber world has changed so much in the last 10 years. And in the UK, we've definitely become more open about our cyber capabilities, right? We have the National Cyber Security Centre, the NCSC, NCSC, which is basically a public-facing wing of GCHQ designed to ta tackle cyber threats. Yeah. Um, and we also have more recently the National Cyber Force. 
Do you think in the next 10 years we're going to continue becoming more open? Is this something industry should be more open about their cyber capabilities as well? Mm, it's a different one, isn't it? Because um, in the military principle, you don't want to reveal your your hand and your defences because, again, since medieval times, that's normally a bad thing uh, <laughs> because people then get in. But I think uh, transparency is definitely on the up. It's part of society's trends. Um, I personally welcome it. I don't think it's something we should be fearful about. We just mm -hmm. have to be cautious about, always think about what, what could be the impact of revealing this information? Um, you mentioned NCSC, and again, on the defensive cybersecurity side, they are the, the prime plugin, and we deal with them at Fortinet uh, and have a great relationship with them, but they're extremely good professionals. And I can't talk for obvious reasons about some of the detail of those things, but what I can say is that we are really lucky in the UK to have a truly professional and world-class national cybersecurity center, but they also are a group of individuals and people that if people are thinking about a career or a job, it's a great place to think about applying to, especially mm. the young, the graduates, because it's a wonderful start for your careers. But the other, other one to mention is really that the NCSC's website I personally think is one of the best Agreed. websites for cybersecurity. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you're a small business or a large organization, whether you're a CISO uh, or uh, an IT leader or a junior, then you can learn so much from that website. And if nothing else, again, from the podcast, if you're thinking you, you're you watching this podcast thinking, I want to learn stuff, then actually just make a, a marker that every week you will spend an hour on that website and your knowledge will grow. It's tremendous. Agreed. They have so much tailored advice and guidance for free to different yeah. organizations, sectors. It's, it's a really, really mm. useful tool. But and transparency, you mentioned, Alex, and that, mm. that's part of it. The mm. website is part of it. There's an awful lot on there which is being shown. Um, and organizations like Fortinet, and we really pride ourselves on being very transparent. So we will always... Uh, promote and put an information out there about when there's been things like vulnerabilities or issues. It's all very easy to talk about the the new new equipment and new products, mm. but we also say when things have been improved, again, quality assurance process, when things have been uh, tightened and gaps have been filled, that's a huge part of the cybersecurity process. And we're very transparent about that. Um, I think that's welcomed. It's part of societal trends. Um, it doesn't always mean if other people aren't transparent that they don't have the same issues. But I think as a company, we're right because the posture to be transparent with your customers and the people who are paying money and working hard to protect themselves, you've got to be honest and transparent as much as you can. It's it's part of being ethical. Mm, that's a really good point. And we've covered a lot here, Chris. This has been a really good session. If you could point us just to one, if I had to do the, the sinful thing of asking you to choose one military strategy mm. out of all of the things we've we've talked through here today, what would you suggest people should take away? Yes, I think the, the one thing to take away from those, again, back to 400 years of military development and how can we learn and improve our cybersecurity, I would say it's actually about preparation. The big thing is preparation. From that, it's probably got a few strands such as training. I mean, it might be red teaming, pen testing, but it's that preparation. Get your, get your shots in early. Get your preparation in early. Because if you get your, um, your chance to train, it's like being an athlete, get things right before the big game starts, then you will be, have a much better chance of success. Um, so I think the big military success of the last 400 years where things have gone right have normally been based on really good training, preparation, and get things ready before. Um, easy to talk about technology and Fortinet, you know, love talking about technology and we, we, we're Don't good worry, at I'm it. Don't worry, I'm guilty of that too. No, we're good at it. But I still <laughs> think, let's everyone think about, while that stuff's going great, what can we all do as individuals to help and uh, prepare individually or as an organization, preparation, sound preparation. Excellent. Great advice. Thank you all so right. much, Chris. Thank you. And that concludes this installment of the Tech for Leaders podcast. We look forward to having you join us again, but for now, farewell. And that brings this week's episode of the Tech for Business Leaders podcast with Mazars to a close. If you enjoyed today's show, please do subscribe to the series and leave a review to help us extend our reach and keep technology at the heart of the business community. We look forward to sharing more with you on our next episode, but for now, please do take care and thank you for listening.